Hi guys, thanks for joining in tonight. We're gonna get started here soon. Um, as always, please stay on mute. Um, we are going to a public comment section later in the meeting. So everyone who wants to speak will have an opportunity to. Um, and in just a couple minutes, we will get started. So if I could get everyone's attention. Um, before we get started, uh, I'm gonna go through a couple of procedural things. Uh, and before that, obviously, I wanna thank everyone for taking your time um, to come out tonight. I realize that's not always an easy thing to do. So we appreciate um, all the public input and that everyone was able to make it out here tonight. Also, um, we're, we're doing this virtually as well. So Autumn from our staff is, is running uh, a meeting for those that couldn't attend in person. So they'll be listening and I guess viewing along with us as we go. So, um, so a, a couple of things um, before we get started, I guess one's a, a procedural issue is this is a public meeting. So everybody in attendance, you absolutely will have an, an opportunity to provide input and provide testimony to the board. Uh, in saying that, however, um, I'm not blaming her, but we do have a court reporter with us tonight recording the proceedings and taking down um, the minutes for us. So it is, it's a pretty vital importance. If you do wish to speak, hopefully if you came in and we, we definitely have plenty of cards. There are the, the little cards where you can fill out your name and address. Um, so when the public hearing part comes and you have an opportunity to provide input, the board's gonna go through those cards asking for public comment. We are gonna request for the court reporter's sake when you, when you get up to speak, please state your name, state your address. And if you forget, that's fine. Someone of us is gonna say, hold on, state your name, state your address. So um, that's just a procedural thing. Thank you people you. can't hear me now. Thank you. Okay. Like, yeah, um, along with the public comment thing. So uh, we've run a few of these meetings throughout the years. Um, one thing that, that's very difficult for us to overcome is in the course of the presentations, maybe the inspection reports, maybe, maybe the legal report, maybe the engineering report, someone gets a question, someone gets a thought and they're like, oh, and they'll, they'll just shout out something. We can't record that with the court reporter. And to be honest, that generally sets off a, a chain reaction of people want to just jump in and start talking. And when we, I'm bad at estimating. I'm gonna guess we have 50 people or more here tonight. When we have that many people that wanna offer their comments, if that sort of thing starts happening, it really derails things and makes the meeting go really long. And we've been, to some of these meetings where that stretches into three, four hours, which I'm doubting anyone wants. So again, please, well, let's keep all the public comments or questions to the public comment period, and, and you'll have that opportunity. Um, the other part is, why are we here? So hopefully you're here for the Fleming Creek. Uh, you may have gotten a notice. Um, the reason that a public meeting's been um, uh, convened is due to this. This is the Michigan Drain Code of 1956 is amended. It's a Michigan state law. Um, I won't read it. It's <laughs> not, not all laws are a couple sentences. This particular law now has grown to be 25 chapters, 625, 30 sections. So, uh, even back then, things could be. <laughs> Where can I get a copy of that book? Okay. We, we can get a copy online, but again, I really can't have people just asking stuff out of the public comment. So. <laughs> but it is online. I, but I can't address that uh, with a link. Uh, yeah. Please do. <laughs> so, Michigan. Uh, it's a state law that governs everything our office does. 
One of the things it governs is county drains. Fleming Creek is a county drain. It is an associated drainage district, or I'll call it roughly a watershed with it. I'll address another thing right off the bat. We know that the drainage district in Fleming Creek is not entirely accurate. It needs to be revised. There's some areas on the fringes that do not drain into the Fleming Creek watershed. So hopefully to head off the question, when we notify all of the property owners in the district <laughs> of this meeting, we over notified with the idea that we're gonna probably have to revise this district to make it more accurate. So we've gotten some questions in the intervening time saying, my water doesn't go this way. Absolutely could be true. So I'm not disputing those type of things here, but the, the reason you're, you're here is that we wanna notify beyond the border so that when we do revise it, if there's some surprises in the way the district turns out, everybody here can still be included in that. So if you're one of those people like in the far east or something, or like, I don't drain that way, you absolutely could be correct and not disputing it, but that's the reason you were invited, okay? So back to the drain code. <clears throat> we're allowed to spend, under the drain code currently, we're allowed to spend $5,000 for every mile of drain we maintain. Um, so Fleming Creek is about a three and a half mile county drain. It goes longer, but the, our section of it is three and a half miles. So we're allowed to spend four times the, the mileage or $20,000 a year on it. Um, and we don't need any input from the public to do that. That's for maintenance and operations. In this particular case, um, we've had some requests on the drain to perform work. We looked at that and we've determined we probably can't do that work for less than $20,000. So drain code lays out and says, you can't spend more than 20,000 on your own. If you want to, you have two options. Either one, property owners living in the district can petition the water resources commissioner to do the work and spend more money or that the townships at large where the district lies, they can petition the commissioner to exceed that spending limit. In this particular case, we've had property owners do that petition. That sets off, again, under the drain code, it's chapter eight, uh, under the drain code, it sets off um, this public hearing tonight. So what, what's going to happen, and hopefully we'll, we'll describe it as we go through, but what we have to do is have an independent board that's not affiliated with our office. They hear public testimony, they hear our reports, they make the decision tonight. Yes, you can spend more than 20,000 to do a project, or no, we don't find necessity. You can't spend 20,000 and you can't do the project. So that's why we're, we're here tonight. Um, and then clearly your testimony will be instrumental in helping them make that decision. So uh, I'm not asking for feedback, but sound fairly clear? Okay. All right. Uh, make sure I covered my preamble. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm going to go through the proceedings. Train code again lays out exactly how this meeting goes. So we're going to pretty much follow that. We'll impanel the board and then they'll take over and run the meeting to that point. All right, okay. So uh, I'm gonna officially call the meeting to order um, at 7.14 on July 23rd. And I'm gonna read off the primary purpose of the meeting. And that goes as follows. The primary purpose of today's meeting is to hear testimony related to the necessity of locating establishing or constructing a drain or drain district or the necessity of improvements to a drain or drain district. The board will decide after public testimony whether the drain or proposed improvements to the drain are necessary and are necessary and conducive to public health, convenience or welfare. So that's all they're doing. Yes, a project, no project. I will add, there's a couple of things the meeting is not about. Um, the, the main ones are, it's not to establish the scope of work. 
So we don't determine at this meeting what's going to get done if you have a project that gets determined afterwards. And we all, because we don't know what is going to get done, we therefore can't <clears throat> create a cost estimate of like, well, how much is it going to cost? So those are, I know those are a common question of what are you going to do? How much is it going to cost? And how much is it going to cost me? Unfortunately, the meeting for those that are interested in that, that's not what this is for. It's purely yes, a project or no. Project. So that being said, um, I want to introduce our board of determination members. So I have, I guess, from my right, <laughs> um, we have Brian Weiner, Andrew Schmidt, and sorry, Megan Morfilio. So again, I want to thank them for being here tonight. I uh, appreciate your time and efforts on this. Also, not everyone always wants to be introduced. We have a lot of staff members from my office here tonight, people out in the hall greeting and doing the cards from my office. We have inspectors, field staff members, our, our communication specialist running the, the meeting. Um, they're all with us. Also some uh, other speakers. We have legal counsel with us tonight, Stacy Hissong is going to present a report on some of the legalities associated with the Fleming Creek and its easements. So I'm happy to have her here tonight. And then finally, um, we definitely um, have public representation. So the, the Fleming Creek lies within Superior and Salem townships and both of uh, the township supervisors, so Gary Whitaker and um, Ken Schwartz are in attendance with us tonight. So I just want to recognize them. And then also thank Superior for lighting the hall. So I left, left anyone out, I apologize. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is panel the board of determination. Okay, uh, for the three of you, I'm gonna ask you a series of five questions. Uh, please answer after each question. All right, first question. Are you a freeholder of land in the state of Michigan? Yes. yes. Do you reside in Washtenaw County? Yes. Do you own land in the drainage district or would you be affected by any special assessment that may be levied? No. Do you feel you can make an unbiased and objective decision based on testimony you receive? Yes. And then finally, this is my question. Could you please raise your right hand and respond to yours? All right. Do you and each of you solemnly swear that you will basically perform and discharge the duties imposed upon you and each of you as required by law as members of the Board of Determination appointed by the Water Resources Commissioner of the County of Washington to determine the necessity of improvements as requested in the Petition dated March 18, 2024, to a certain drain known and designated as the Fleming Creek Drain in the townships of Salem and Superior in said county. Yes. All right, thank you. So, in your packets, there is a proposed agenda. Um, I think it's on the second tab. Um, so, at this point, I would turn the board or the proceedings over to the board. And if you want to adopt, adopt the agenda and elect the chair and secretary, that would be the first order of business for me. Thank you. Um, thank you. I can make a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, I support discussion. All in favor? Aye. We have an agenda. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we need to elect a secretary chairperson for the proceedings this evening. Is there a motion to nominate? I can make a motion to nominate Andrew Schmidt, chairperson. And I, would we have to second that first or second? Okay. Support any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, Next up would be a nomination for secretary for the board. <clears throat> I'd like to move uh, Megan to serve in that capacity. Support? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. 
you know, legislative officers. Uh, next up, um, we're going to have a couple rules uh, associated with public comment this evening. So as you're listening to the DRAIN report, uh, you might want to tailor your comments to fit within that uh, within that constraint. So we're, we're looking to place a three minute limit on each of the speakers. So you get up uh, one time, three minutes, and uh, that's, uh, that's the go for this, so uh, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, we're gonna make sure that everybody who needs an opportunity to speak uh, will have such an opportunity. Or is there someone who will be monitoring that time and you let the speaker know that we should have to take Thank you, thank you. All right, uh, so we're gonna start out with the history of the train. And uh, Scott, I believe you're gonna yeah, give us that history before we head into some of the other uh, the other items here. Yes, that's me again. <laughs> All right, let's get this here. Okay, so the history of the Plumbing Creek Drain. Um, Plumbing Creek Drain was established in 1870. Um, we have had uh, a number of petitions um, to clean or otherwise improve the drain over the years. From that point, but it was officially we, we got the first establishment in our files in 1870. So um, the drainage district. Question, Brenda. Really? Am I that one? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yes. Speak into the mic. Gosh, okay. I've never been told that before. <clears throat> All right, sorry. All right, so the Fleming Creek Drainage District consists of a number of sub-districts. Sub Those include Arbor Hills, Fleming Meadows, Gear, Glenboro Number no. 1, Hickory Ridge Park, John Wagner, Kinsley, Laraway, Mystic Forest Condo, and Timberwood Estates. It is also abutted by another number of drainage districts uh, under the official county system. Uh, the drain district lies in portions of Salem Township as well as portions of Superior Township. Generally speaking, it is bounded by Brookville Road, Godfordson Road, Ford Road, M153, um, and Voorhees Road. So on, on the, you guys have it in your packet, um, a, a smaller version of this, but we do have maps Paper maps, if people want to kind of look at, and this one's outlined in purple, what the current district for Plumbing, Plumbing Creek is, and then the creeks in dark blue. All right, um, apportionments. So uh, the apportionments are divided among 3.7% to county roads, 6.4% to MDOT, 7.5% to Salem Township, 27.44% to Superior Township, with the remainder paid by the property owners, which constitutes around 54%. Uh, there, are, there are 1,158 parcels in the district. Um, the number of acres totals 9,343. Uh, assessment history. The drain has been assessed uh, periodically over the last five years, generally speaking, in the seven to ten thousand dollar range a year. So under the maintenance limit of twenty thousand, that has worked out to be somewhere between three and five dollars <throat> for the average property owner, um, and that shows up. It's not a tax. So it's it's an assessment. So. If we don't do any work on the drain, you don't pay any money. Uh, this is the way it works. If we do work, then we assess it. It shows up on your winter tax bill, so a lot of people relate it to the taxes, especially if you see it every year, but, but it is actually an assessment based on work. So, um, maintenance um, has been fairly restricted over the years due to, to access issues, um, but it's been primarily brush down trees, obstruction removal um, in the channel. Um, 
All right. Um, prior petitions, I have a few listed. Some date again dating to 1870. We have one from 1891, 1928, 1957, 1979, and possibly 1997. So, it requires a short history if you had any questions. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next up, um, legal report. Sure. Thank you again. Good evening. My name is Stacy Hassan. I'm the attorney for the drainage district. If it's okay with the board, I'll give a little bit more explanation about time. How many of you have been at a board of determination before? You are in for a treat. Yeah. We're going to learn so much about the drain code. You're going to go home, have dinner after this, and say, oh my goodness. Um, so again, uh, I'm Stacey I'm going to work at the law firm of Biggie Schultz Bursic Roads, and I'm sure you're all going to be jealous of me. I specialize in drainage uh, across the state of Michigan, and so I've been to a few hundred of these. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about more. I think Scott did a fantastic job of explaining what what uh, to come up in this meeting, but I want to go through a little bit more detail and unpack some of that. So um, as he, we've had a drain code since we've been a territory, even before a state, it was one of the first uh, acts passed um, in the state of Michigan dealing with these things. And so it's not surprising to hear that you have a drain that's been under the jurisdiction of the drain commissioner, now water resources commissioner, for over a century. So when Scott mentioned we can only spend so much money, that means that there's discretion of the drain commissioner to do work when things come up for small items that are under the discretion of the Water Resources Commissioner Office, but anything that hits that dollar limit or constitutes an improvement has to be performed by a petition, as he mentioned. And so that can only come from property owners or a municipality. So when we're dealing with a drainage district, um, that's made up, that means that even the maintenance dollars, any dollar spent for this drainage district is paid, or for this drain is paid for by the drainage district. So when you think of a drainage district, it's the same as a special assessment district, who's paying? And when I also use the word, so drainage district is the same as special assessment district, is the same as watershed. So any time, any piece of property that's within it, that a drop of water falls and eventually gets to the drain is part of the watershed, part of the special assessment district, is part of the drainage district. And so you got invited here tonight because you probably have your lands that have water contributing to the drain and so therefore are part of the drainage district and, and potentially receiving a special assessment if a project moves forward. And so when Scott talked about this line, this, these lines um, are made up of, from historical projects. And so as you can imagine, what the surveyors from 1870 put on the line is what the land's contributing to the watershed has probably surveying has improved over time and land changes take place like a highway through the middle of it takes place and so that um, causes revisions to the watershed lines to happen and so that normally takes place as part of the project. And so it's important to hear from you because again you're the property owners that make up the entities that will be paying for this project and, and how it moves forward. So I'm going to just reiterate quickly a few of the items so everybody gets good understanding of what's going on. And so like I said, every penny is paid for by special assessment even within the maintenance budget that you hear of. There is no federal, state, county, local budget for drains. All of it is paid for by the drainage district the state for benefit to state highways, the county for benefit to county roads, <clears throat> the townships for at-large public health, and then to the property owners. Okay, so um, again, there was a discussion about um, the board of determination only decides yes or no. That is the only decision they make tonight. And so they don't have information about what the scope of the project will be. You're going to hear an inspection report um, about the condition of the drain. And so really they're hearing, is the condition of the drain such that it needs improved maintenance or improvements? No engineering per se has taken place because we don't want to spend money on something that people decide isn't a problem. So we wait until, and this has been since statehood, this is the process. So they decide, is there a problem? Then it gets kicked back to the Water Resources Commissioner's Office to review that, decide what should be done. 
your voices are very important in that because they've heard from the petitioners, they've done an inspection report, but you live there. So your testimony is very helpful to the members of the Water Resources Commissioner's Office in hearing what you are experiencing as drainage problems or not drainage problems, not only to aid the Board of Determination in deciding should a project take place, but also to aid the Water Resources Commissioner staff in under better understanding from you, the people who live there, what problems need to be addressed when they're looking at potential solutions. And so a few things, when you are testifying after the inspection report, your job is really to, you can say whatever you want when you come up here, it's public comment, but your job is really to aid the board of determination in deciding is a project necessary or not necessary. So providing them information about what you're experiencing as a problem or not problem related to drainage is very important to allow them to make a good decision. Now, I said, I've literally been at hundreds of these, and even though Scott told you, we don't know what the project is going to be, and we don't know how much it will be, so we, you don't know how much is assessed, I just told you that, I guarantee somebody's going to say, well, I want to know how much this is going to cost, um, because, I mean, I understand you're a property owner that's going to be liable for assessment. We just don't have that information available to us today, because the legislature has set out the process, this is step one. After there's a determination, should we even move to the engineering, then we get into the nitty gritty, so to speak, that's a legal term, not an engineering term, as to what the scope of the project should be. So with that, um, that's really what the board is deciding after that to get kicked back and your testimony is essential mm -hmm. into helping them make that decision. And so with that board, if you have any other questions, um, just a couple of other things <clears throat> I wanna mention. So within, the drainage district, not everything that conveys water is under the jurisdiction of the Water Resources Commissioner. So what is established as the drain is where there's jurisdiction, where there's an open drain by law, the drain code gives the right to enter the property and perform work. But Scott mentioned some sub-districts. There's our tributaries, water that flows from different established county drains into this drain. This petition doesn't give the right to do work on those, only the main drain. Then I, at these, I often hear pre people say, well, let's just do self-help. Why don't you get out and dig out your part of the ditch and you get out and dig out your part of the ditch and we won't have a problem. Well, as you can imagine, it's much more complex than that. First, this is a regulated water course. And so um, it requires permits from Eagle. It requires soil erosion permits. And so I advise against self-help in certain circumstances other than keeping things uh, clean and debris, et cetera, out of it. But self-help is not the answer, especially when it's already well, under the jurisdiction of the Water Resources Commissioner. And so um, just asking the board and others to keep that in mind as we go. Yeah, it might be worth clarifying what, what EGLE is. Okay, oh, what EGLE is, is uh, the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, formerly known as DEQ. Um, so this is anytime work is performed, um, it would require a permit for a regular property owner to, to get not only a permit from the Water Resources Commissioner, but a permit under Part 301 um, to take certain activities. Some activities are exempt if it's performed by the Water Resources Commissioner's office, but definitely not allowed by a private owner. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I feel like you should have recorded your comments for... <laughs> Unfortunately, no, but um, a great member of our staff, so Mr. Jeff Peters, is the drain inspector with our office, is prepared to do that for us. Welcome, Jeff. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Peters. I am a drain inspector for the Washington County uh, Water Resources Commissioner's Office. And I don't know what will work best for the board. So we do have a PowerPoint. PowerPoint yeah. We have a PowerPoint that's going to go behind there. And then also, hopefully, some or all of you can kind of see on the, the main screen what he's going through. I'm give you a quick overview here. Um, established in 1870, the Plenty Creek drain is approximately 19,102 feet in length, or 3.62 miles. 
The upper channel drain begins at the outflow of the Nelson Drain at Toy Road in Section 3 of Superior Township. It traverses through Sections 4, 8, 9, and ends at Ford Road in Section 17 of Superior Township. Okay. <clears throat> Nelson Drain comes down and is in the Fleming Creek right here. But it travels southwesterly towards Fleming. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there is variable easement throughout the course of the Fleming Creek drain. And it has an annual maintenance limit of $20,000. The inspection was conducted by myself on uh, June 20th, 21st, 24th, July 2nd, and 3rd of 2024. Uh, area A of the drain, I've divided the drain into four areas for the purpose of the report here. This is area A. An aerial there, or I'm sorry, you started to press down here. Yes, area A off of Ford Road. There we go. Area A, um, the drain between Ford Road and M153. Uh, the drain channel is discernible with a primarily standing bottom. Intermittent areas of sediment up to 12 inches. The bank height varies from one to four feet. Channel width varies from 10 to 30 feet. Areas of deadfall and heavy brush are hanging into the drain channel. Uh, observed one beaver dam number one, as I'm calling it, uh, observed approximately 150 feet downstream of the M153 crossing at point five. Uh, we have a bridge at Plymouth Road in good condition, and we have crossing at M153 in good condition with minimal sediment under the crossing. Do some photos here. Uh, point one from the map is an example of the typical channel conditions uh, with overhanging brush and sandy bottom. Point two is deadfall in the drain channel. Uh, it's recent deadfall from a storm about a month ago. Uh, restricting flow and has a sandy bottom. Point three is an example of low hanging brush collecting debris and restricting flow. Point four is the Plymouth Road Bridge, which is in good condition, photos looking upstream. Point five is Beaver Dam number one, which is approximately 106 feet downstream of the M153 crossing restricting flow. Uh, the photo is <coughs> upstream. And then we have point six, which is the M153 crossing. And again, the photo again looking upstream. All right, area B. Uh, the drain between M153 and Albert Road. Uh, the initial first 550 feet upstream of them, 153 crossing was difficult to walk when I did it, when I expected it. Has a width of 30 to 40 feet, 12 to 24 inches of sediment, deadfall, and beaver dam number two. Located at point nine, obstructing flow. Uh, I was unable to walk and inspect the next 2,100 feet of the drain between points 9 and 10 of the drain channel due to high water caused by beaver dam number two, sediment, and restricted access. Uh, we did do an aerial inspection, which was completed, and observations include no discernible drain channel and water approximately three to four foot in depth, extending outside the regular drain channel banks 400 feet. Uh, then we have a portion of the drain approximately 1,100 feet in length between points 10 and 14 downstream of Albert Road, which has a discernible channel with a width of 10 to 30 feet, bank height of 1 to 4 feet, a primarily sandy bottom, areas of deadfall and low hanging brush in the drain channel, obstructing flow. And the Albert Road bridge is in good condition. What you see here is these are a couple of comparison aerial photos. Uh, we have the 2020 aerial photo, which Autumn's going to kind of point out in a couple of sectors. Scott will. Uh, 
the left side. The, yep, this area, the Scott's point right here is, is primary, <laughs> is, a, is basically a, a grassy wetland uh, where the channel goes through it. And in the photo on, from 2023, uh, you'll notice that the water is outside of the drain banks above that sky. Yeah. You know, just say this is 2023. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, where the water is outside of the, the drain banks. <clears throat> there. Oh, this is pre, pre beaver dam, post beaver dam. Yes. Okay, point number seven. Uh, 12 to 24 inches of sediment in the drain channel and heavy aquatic vegetation. Point number eight is 12 to 24 inches of sediment and deadfall in the drain channel. Point number nine, which is beaver dam number two. Uh, the dam is approximately four to five feet in height, with approximately 550 feet upstream of the M153 crossing obstructing flow. 12 to 24 inches of sediment in the channel. This is an aerial view of point number nine uh, of beaver dam number two, obstructing flow. Uh, the red circle indicates the location of the beaver dam, and the white arrows indicate the location and flow of the drain channel. This is another aerial photo um, of the impoundment which has been created by the beaver dam number two. Uh, there is no discernible channel. Uh, the water is approximately three foot, three, four feet in, dip, in depth, <coughs> extending outside the regular drain channels, banks approximately 400 feet. And after this, we have a quick 30 second video, which we took, uh, aerial video, which we took, which is directly, which we took directly over the beaver dam number two. You see the impoundment there. That's the landfill up there. <laughs> and at the bottom to the left of that building there, bottom, can you point it out? Right at the edge of the trees, Scott. Right at the edge of the, what am I pointing out? The beaver dam is, is right, right in there, just right at the edge of the trees. Okay. Point number 10. Uh, an example of heavy vegetation. I was unable to walk this part of the channel. Due to high water and sediment, uh, this photo is looking downstream. Point 11. Uh, this is recent deadfall and channel restricting flow. And point number 12. An example of blocking brush and deadfall restricting flow. Point number 13. Uh, we have a 24 inch HDPE private pond outlet. Point 14. It's the Albert Road Bridge. Um, it's in good condition and has a sandy bottom. The photo is looking upstream. There you see, uh, which is between Albert Road and Curtis Road. Uh, the drain channel is discernible with a primarily sandy bottom with intermittent areas of sediment up to 18 <laughs> inches. Bank height varies between one to six feet. Uh, the channel width varies approximately between 10 and 30 feet. Uh, areas with deadfall and heavy brush hanging into the drain. Uh, there is a large sediment island at the downstream side of the Curtis Road crossing obstructing flow. Uh, there are several crossings in this uh, section of the drain. Uh, one private old footbridge at point 17, uh, private farm crossing footbridge at point 19, private farm crossing footbridge at point 20, uh, private farm crossing at point 22, and uh, the Curtis Road crossing is a double barrel uh, 10 foot box culvert, which contains 12 to 24 inches of sediment within the culvert and has set up an island on the downstream side, restricting flow and heavy vegetation.
with 15. Uh, that's an example of a deadfall in the drain channel collecting debris at 16. That's <clears throat> uh, a private pond outflow by 17. Uh, mm -hmm. Private foot bridge in poor condition by 18. That's uh, the farm, farm fence in the old farm fence in the drain channel. Uh, sediment in this area is 12 to 18 inches. Point 19. Uh, the private farm footbridge, which is in good condition. Point 20. Is another uh, private farm footbridge in good condition. Point 21. Um, Example is the erosion is the sharing on the north side of the drain channel. At 22. Uh, another private farm bridge in good condition. And point 23. It's the Curtis Road crossing, uh, which has a large sediment island restricting flow, heavy vegetation, and the photo is looking upstream. <laughs> All right, area D, last section of the drain. Uh, the drain channel is discernible with a primarily sandy bottom with intermittent areas of sediment from six to 24 inches. Uh, bank height varies between one to six feet. Channel width varies between 10 to 30 feet. Uh, there is a large sediment island on the upstream side of the Curtis Road crossing, restricting flow and heavy vegetation. Uh, the outflow of the John Wagner drain is uh, deadfall restricting flow. It's at point 34. Uh, areas with deadfall and heavy brush hanging into the drain channel the entire length of this area. Uh, it has one private footbridge in moderate condition at point 30. And the Joy Road crossing is um, a pair of six by eight corrugated metal pipe culverts. Uh, area has heavy vegetation with minimal sediment within the culverts. Okay, point 24. It's the Curtis Road crossing looking downstream. Uh, <coughs> Arch Sediment Island on the right there, which is on the north side, um, restricting flow, uh, 12 to 24 inches of sediment within the culverts, um, heavy vegetation. Point, we have another couple photos from point 24 here. Uh, we have a roadside outlet, which is a 12 inch corrugated metal pipe. And this photo is looking upstream from the same point. Uh, it's a private <laughs> farm, fence, farm fence crossing the drain uh, with heavy vegetation. Again, this is looking upstream. Point 25 is an example of deadfall and heavy vegetation in the drain. Um, we had to get out and walk through the brush. On the banks, we couldn't even walk through this area. Uh, point 26, an example of uh, typical low hanging brush in the drain, and the drain has a sandy bottom. Point 27, uh, another typical uh, photo of some low hanging brush. This portion of the drain has a silty bottom. Point 28, uh, an example of deadfall in the drain channel. Point 29, another example of deadfall and blocking brush in the drain channel in a small southern island in the middle of the drain channel. Point 30 is a private footbridge in moderate condition. Point 31, uh, deadfall in channel restricting flow, we get a silky bottom. Point 32 is an eight inch. PVC uh, private outflow. Is that for what you're supposed to? Can they hold that so the public can have it? Thank you. Point 33. Uh, deadfall in the channel, restricting uh, flow. This is again uh, recent storm damage. Point 34. It's the outflow of the John Wagner drain, uh, deadfall restricting flow. Point 35, 
Uh, this is Joy Road Crossing, again, which is two uh, six by eight corrugated metal pipe culverts, uh, which are in good condition. This photo is looking off street. The culvert on the left is behind the brush. And again, from point number 35, this is Joy Road Crossing, photo looking down the street. Quick summary here. Uh, most notable observed obstructions in the drain channel are two beaver dams located at points number five and number nine, restricting flow and reducing storage capacity during storm events. Additionally, two sediment islands located upstream and downstream of the Curtis Road crossing most likely restrict uh, water flow during storm events, along with low hanging brush and deadfall throughout the Fleming Creek drain. The drain channel banks vary from one to six feet in height with one notable point of bank erosion, point number 21. The sediment depth is moderate throughout the areas uh, ranging from four to 24 inches. Uh, the crossings in general are in good to moderate condition with the exception of an old private footbridge at point 17 in poor condition. Board have any questions? Not this point, Jeff. Thank you very much. That was excellent. All right. Um, we're now going to proceed into the public comment uh, period of this meeting. And um, for our discussion or comments earlier, if you have questions that aren't really comments focused on whether or not there should be a project. Um, we would request that you direct those to staff outside the this particular forum. Um, the comments here that we're looking for are to understand whether or not there should be a project uh, investigated uh, to address um, some of the items that were uh, uh, discussed in the inspector's report. Okay, on that note, um, we're going to have folks come up to the podium here, uh, we ask that you state your name and your address and identify whether or not you live or have lands in the drainage district. Uh, and we'll proceed through. Um, I have, I guess, 10 cards here or so. Uh, if you haven't filled out a card and would like to make public comment, please fill out a card and get it to one of our staff folks and they'll Get you up, get you into the list so you can uh, uh, make comment. Yes, sorry. I just wanted to let everyone know on Zoom if you wanted to make a comment, please raise your hand and we will um, get to you. I will fill out a card for you. Um, go back and forth. Thank you. All right. So we're going to kick things off. Uh, public comment is now open. Uh, first up is Thomas Lawson. As I've said, my name is Tom Lawson. Please, excuse me. Please, uh, That's it. Yeah, I don't want to talk to the board too long. What's that? Please, uh, come back this way. Okay. Oh, what? <laughs> Please state your name and your address. My name is Tom Lawson. I live at 6629 Fleming Creek Drive. Okay, and what happens is Fleming Creek. Things. One is Fleming Creek, of course, denotes the northern part of our lot. Um, it, uh, about 30% of my lot is a floodplain. And I am concerned about the flow of the water, of course. But I'm also concerned about this project that's going on in Plymouth, Ro on Plymouth Road where they're backfilling the lot that, that's contiguous to my property. And I want to make sure that uh, they're not filling in the floodplain that is going to cause me to have an even bigger lake, which we call Lawson Lake, uh, than, than we did, do have. So I'd like somebody to address that. Number two is, uh, I've got willow trees along Fleming Creek, 
And for those of you that don't know uh, about willow trees, they're a dirty tree. So I wind up with a bunch of limbs from the willow tree um, in, the, in the Fleming Creek. And so what happens is I, myself, uh, clear the creek of those limbs. And I'm, I'm wondering why we would have a special assessment when other people should be clearing the creek also. So uh, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, uh, that, that that's being considered at all. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Linda Hamilton. My name is Linda Hamilton. I live at 6905 Mile Road in Madison, Salem Township. I represent a family that's owned its land here since 1826, so before you had the Fleming Creek Drainage District. First, just a suggestion to future boarding and terminations. <clears throat> in the era in which we live, a lot of discussion of transparency in government. It would be nice when you're preparing to come and speak if you could see this report prior to sitting here. It's very hard to take notes. We weren't provided any type of documentation as we walked in the room. To me, it seems a little bit ludicrous, again, in the 21st century, that you can't get the report. The only way that you can get a copy of the petition for the six properties that petitioned this work is under freedom of information. Understand you don't want the address, but the foolishness of that is you take the parcel number, go to eWash, now parcel lookup, and you have everybody's name, their address, and your information. This is all, all these property owners live along Cynthia or Albert. So real flat land if you go drive it. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit then and talk about how we're impacted. I told you that I belong to a farming family, 198 years of owning the same property. We practice best conservation measures on our farm. We have, and we have several creeks that run through it. We don't farm up to the creek edge. We don't let our animals run anywhere near a creek. And we always have fall cover crops on our land. I watched and listened tonight, and most of what I saw, other than the beavers being beavers, looks like it's routine maintenance. Some of the deadfall that we have, we were told was from a storm last month. This petition was filed in March. And uh, somebody from the drain commissioner's office, and I'm good at remembering names, said that they can spend up to $20,000 a year. Spend $20,000 a year and do routine maintenance. And you won't have a build of the sediment. You won't have old deadfall in the creek because you'll take care of it as it happens. And as probably one of the larger property owners in the room tonight, I don't want to pay for routine maintenance that should be done on an annual basis because six houses think that the rest of us should have to pay. Thank you. Next up, uh, Arthur Cole. My name is Arthur Cole. I live at 7270 Warren Road, which is at, uh, just approximately just north of uh, Station 12 on the, on the map, on the north side of M14. And my comment is simply that uh, the problems shown in the, in the uh, PowerPoint presentation are confined to the south side of M14. When the highway was built, the uh, Construction did build a new drainage system along both sides of 14. And on the north side, it seems to work very well. There are very few flooding or other uh, issues on the north side. This issue is confined principally 
to the south side of M14. So I concur with others that this is an isolated problem that uh, might be uh, remedied with routine maintenance if that's what's called for for deadfall and plant and, uh, and for beavers, which I understand are tasty. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next up, Pat Malita. Pat Malita. Uh, David King. David King. My name is David King, 8482, and I'm a West, and I'm here to speak about the deer drain for Fleming Creek problem. And uh, I have photos and a long history, been there for years, and I could help. I was here walking Berry Road before Berry Road was open from Ford Road, and I live in that area. And the uh, along Berry Road, the trees on the east side, there was a field there. So I've been there a long time. We have, of course, lack of maintenance. I talked endless number of times to the drain commission. I have that drain runs through my property. I happen to be the low point. Well, I may be lower than the lakes, but I get flooded out and I've got lots of photos to show that. And um, been willing to talk to anybody about doing something about that because of course it affects the price of my property. So I'm anxious to have something done on that property. I have runoff of the property east of me. Of course, they flood just like I do. And the, they, even though they put new piping in on the neighbor's property, it's not adequate, not big enough. And they flood. So when they flood, I flood. All right. No. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Ed Bretzloff. I quit your bond has some dreams. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence Young. <clears throat> My name is Lawrence Young. I live at 4379 Walden Drive, 48105. I'm in the district. Um, it's not obvious to me with the information that's been presented tonight how you can possibly make a determination of whether this should be a good project or not. It's not obvious to me by what's been presented whether what's going on now is worse than it used to be or how long it's taken to get to this point with the uh, sediment buildup and the trees falling in, et cetera, and the growth along the edges. Uh, it's not that I doubt that that stuff is there. It's just that it's not obvious to me that that's what's causing a problem. And you haven't presented the information to let me know whether that's causing a problem. And you haven't made a statement to that effect either. So you haven't been doing annual maintenance. You said you had twenty k dollars authorized per year, and you're only spending seventy four hundred up or something that effect. Um, I'm not blaming you for that. What your boss is telling you to do, but. I don't, it, it, it's just not obvious to me what's causing this problem. The other thing is, is this problem, is this coming up as a result of global warming? I mean, in the last five years, I, I've been in my property for 30 years. I've had my basement flood three times. The reason is not flooding of the drain, it's watershed. 
And with Barrel, we had a hell of a rain, more than we've seen in a long time, five years ago, I think it was. We had an even worse drain, uh, worse rain, which flooded my basement. But those don't come very often, but they seem to be coming more frequently than they used to. So my, the other point that's unclear to me is whether this is a global warming associated problem or whether it's just a routine lack of maintenance problem. So to my point, it's not obvious to me that you can make a decision on if we spend a lot of money there, is that going to fix the problem? So I, don't, I, don't, I don't see how you can make that determination. Thank you. Uh, next up, I, I'm going to say J, J. M. Sunal. Maybe it's Jan Sinal. Well, I'm here. I didn't. I didn't check for a comment. Oh, okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl Hegwood. I didn't check for a comment. <laughs> I'm sorry? I, I didn't want to speak. You don't want to speak either? Okay. Uh, Anna O'Connell? Good evening. I'm Anna O'Connell. I live at 4233 Mario Court, <coughs> approximately between 0.25 and 26 on the net. My, the very Rear of my property impinges along the border of the drain. It does sometimes <coughs> overflow. And the residents of Mario Court, particularly, cooperate to remove deadfalls from the part that is within our little bitty subdivision and generally have not had any serious problems with flooding related to the drain. Now, there are some other problems caused by poor grading of lots, but that's not your problem, that's our problem. Um, I would like to urge you to take a minimally invasive path of clearing the deadfall, routinely, routinely inspecting, clearing the worst of it out first, and catching up in years where we don't have quite so many storms with tree dirt, with dropping trees because the last two years have been fairly extreme in terms of wind damage in the wooded areas along um, M14. And there are a lot of wooded areas there. Thank you. Uh, Kim Sauvé. Yep. Thank you for uh, <laughs> adding up my mispronunciation. <laughs> The, first of all, that, oh, let's see. My name is Kim Sove, and my wife and I live at 3875 Albert Drive, just to the west side of the bridge. And uh, first, I'd like to thank all you guys for taking your time. And also, thank you, Jeff. You and I have spoken on the phone a couple times for your bushwhacking and all you've done there. Um, <clears throat> we've lived there about 30 years or 30 plus years, <clears throat> and we have. Um, We've always had some degree of uh, flooding or where the, where the creek comes over its banks to some degree into our yard in the springtime. Usually if there's a, um, a melt off when the ground is still frozen. Um, recently it's gotten worse. And as some of the other folks have pointed out, of course we have the global warming <clears throat> issues going on where we have bigger storms that spin up here. And we have had some really good wind storms. In fact, in our little area, we had a, uh, I guess it was three or four weeks ago when we had a bunch of trees come down. Um, one, one of my neighbors who lives on Cynthia Drive on the opposite side of the creek from us has gone up and down the creek and taken out um, windfalls and brush and so, so forth. And I, in fact, I was sitting on the porch when he came wading up the creek one day and he, this, um, I think maybe five or six weeks ago when we had quite a bit of flooding, it may have been longer than that, but this year um, he went out, he had some quite good flooding too. Um, uh, the flooding at our house came up quite a bit farther than we have had in the past. He went to investigate and that's when he found that beaver dam 
which is to the east side of Ford Road or, or 153. And so I, I I didn't know there was another Beaver Dam to the west of 153 too, but to, to us, it appears that the flooding has been significantly worse since the appearance of the beavers. And you know, I know they do good work, but it's been, it looks like a problem to us. And as we get more of the hurricanes and more of the um, more uh, uh, heavy rains and weather like that, I think we're going to have more trouble. But anyway, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, one more call for Pat Malita. Okay. Um, do we have any remote uh, commenters? Yes, we do. Um, first is Alex. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, and then please be sure to state your name and address for us. Sure thing, thank you. This is Alex Taylor of 3715 Prospect Road. I wanted to say that I support improvements to our infrastructure towards the resiliency of our stormwater system. Uh, obviously it has to handle heavy rain events, which are increasingly common. Uh, similar to the first speaker, my neighbor also utilized a landfill. Uh, now their property is elevated 12 to 18 inches relative to mine and I have repeat flooding issues on my land as a result. And I was interested, would there be in improvements to the feeder ditch along Prospect Road to help with local property drainage, uh, which eventually drains to Fleming Creek, or is that out of scope of the water board? Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Kelly Carter. Hi, thank you, good evening. Uh, my name is Kelly Carter. I live at 7486 Plymouth Road, um, and I am uh, actually on the north shore of Frains Lake and across the street from properties um, directly abutting Fleming Creek. And I guess I have sort of three um, questions. Uh, my first question is whether the inlet from Frains Lake to Fleming Creek is part of the drain or whether that's considered outside of the drain as far as maintenance or improvements are concerned. My second question is, um, I, I know that, that we were presented with observations. My question, I think sort of piggybacks on a prior question is um, whether these observations are considered normal or abnormal, which of them's which of them are considered within normal limits or outside normal limits. Um, and more importantly, I think what we did not hear tonight is what, of the, what is the impact of the observed conditions that were presented here tonight. Now, I know that we've heard from an occasional um, homeowner here or there who may have experienced negative impacts. My bigger question, I guess, is can, uh, is there, um, a direct line between what was observed to uh, negative impacts as a whole, or do we have very limited negative impacts as a result of the observed conditions? And then finally, if there is a determination tonight that um, a, uh, a some conditions uh, need to be improved, um, Will that process allow for additional input from the community to number one, um, review engineering um, impacts and have an additional impact input on whether uh, uh, proposed um, improvements should be made? And more importantly, would we have the opportunity to um, uh, agree or disagree as to whether those improvements could be prioritized such that um, they might be uh, included over a multi-year process um, such that we could do it within the 20,000 uh, per year allotment as opposed to any additional uh, assessments. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. Marcella? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Marcella Hagui from 3249 Andor Drive. 
Superior Township. Uh, we're in the Glenboro uh, homeowners group here. And I believe our subdivision has established quite rigorous uh, guidelines for keeping the Fleming Creek drain uh, quite well. First of all, I wanna thank Scott Miller, Jeff Peters and Stacy for their excellent presentations tonight. And I just wanted to make that comment that Glenboro has been very rigorous in our um, protection of this Fleming Creek watershed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Angela Kane, did you want to speak? Yeah, I, 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 I've been obviously commenting through the, you know, at the meeting. Can you hear me? Uh, yep. Can you state your name and address for us? Yeah, I'm Angela Kane. I live in the Glenborough subdivision. Thank you, Marcella. So well spoken. Um, yeah, I live at 3420 Andorra Drive. So I'm like three, three houses in from Ford Road. Um, I was really shocked to get this letter. I've only lived here for 13 years, but I gather that homeowners that have been here longer had a previous assessment about the Fleming Creek drain. Um, and thankfully, and thank you, at least we got the letter this time, a very vague letter that I then had to ask questions about via the email address. And I got the redacted petition. Um, and only yesterday then did I get something from a totally different organization, a media organization that gave me the agenda for the meeting and gave me the report, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm at the University of Michigan. I'm not used to having to respond like on the, you know, on, on, on a wing. Um, this is, I just felt this was really badly handled, but I gather that the previous time, and I've put this in the chat and I've also asked, will people at the meeting actually have access to the chat? Because I think the chat in itself has been really informative and really pointed um, about the, this whole situation. Um, so yeah, I'm not used to having to deal to speak within 24 hours of getting substantial information. Um, but I gather that previously, when the, uh, an assessment was levied to certain Glenborough people many, many years ago, they didn't even get a notification. They simply got a bill that they had to, you know, add to their property taxes. So the fact that this has happened, I am I am very grateful for, and I thank the Washington All Drains Committee for, um, it, but we had to really dig to get the information about what this petition was and, and why we in Glenborough are at all liable when it seems to be that the, the drain situation is so far away from Glenborough. And as Marcella said, we we take care of our roads, we take care of our drains. Uh, and as I've said in the chat, I, I can't understand why this one tiny, tiny section of Glenborough, that like the Ford Road end of Glenborough versus the whole Andorra Drive through to Cherry Hill is in the drain area and therefore potentially financially liable Yet so many of my neighbors through the subdivision actually live on Fleming Creek and, and they have access to the creek. We love walking to the borough because of the footpath that's been you know built there, but that has flooding issue. So we have flooding issues within Glenborough, but where I live on the east side, we don't have any any flooding issues we are so elevated our properties are so elevated so please just i just hope my i wasn't expecting to speak um i would like to give another opportunity for anybody we do have, still have um another person on oh i'm sorry yep 
uh, Dave. <coughs> So oh, yes. don't you mute me. I, I put all of my comments in the chat. I wasn't expecting to speak. I was listening to what other people said, and I was grateful for their informed decisions and their comments in the chat. So please don't mute me. I, I didn't want to speak, but I have spoken and I'm really disappointed about the way this has all played out. I'm going to are there any other She's individuals that would care yep, to speak? Sorry, we have uh, Dave. Is, <coughs> wants to Hi, yes. uh, my name is Dave Bernardi, 4297 Mario Court. I'm right uh, on Fleming Creek at uh, Curtis Road and uh, M14. And uh, part of my property also is in, it has a little floodplain area. I've lived there since 1991, built a house there. I can honestly say that I have not, I don't see any significant difference from the time I lived there till now on how that creek flows. In the summertime, uh, in August, when we don't get much rain, it still flows. There's still water in it. It's going down the creek. When we have the big flood, it is the floodplain gets flooded sometimes when we have really uh, lots of rain and it drains it. I took a video, I sent it into the Department of Health with this last big rain we had. That drain is working just fine like it always has over there. Now, <clears throat> I do see some of the things, trees and things that are in the water. My One of my questions the board, I think the board needs to consider is, what has been done with the $20,000 a year to keep this drain clean over all the last however many years? I think you need to know that. You can't make a decision like this without knowing that. Um, what happens if we have more storms? The weather, they talk about glo global warming. We're going to have more trees going in there. Is there going to be another special assessment? Uh, things to think about. Um, the uh, uh, money for this, have we checked everywhere we could check with federal government, with the infrastructure bill, with the storms and damages they have in other states and cities and hail damages where government comes in and gives some money for it. Has any of that been researched and researched thoroughly to find out if there's money that can be put towards that from grants like that? And then the last thing I'd like to have you consider is you don't go re sign a contract to remodel your house and not have any idea what it's going to cost to do it. So how can you possibly make a decision to say, yes, go ahead and do this without having any idea what it's going to cost. It just seems like a totally ridiculous statement that the attorney made, the first person made. I don't see how the board can make that decision. So thank you very much for your time. Those those are my comments. Thank you. Dave, did you send us the video via email? Yes, I did. Do you want us to play that for you? That's up to you. What what does it come from? It's a sh it's short. It's maybe ten or fifteen seconds of the flow. Not even that. Yeah. yeah. While we're resolving uh, technical issues, if there is anybody else here that would like to speak, uh, and submit an card. Yet, um, please, uh, please that, yeah, that's the that is the limit. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. All right, did we have anyone else uh, on Zoom who would like to uh, address the board or speak? I'm going to have to defer to staff. Yep. And she's going to plug it in for you. Are there any other remotes? It does not look like we have anyone else remote. Very good. Uh, Next up, uh, Clark 
Karen? Yes, Karen. Karen. So, John Clark Karen, I live at 8963 Joy Road at Salem. And so I just wanted to show here uh, how we've been affected. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience as we work out this uh, technical. Yeah, I do have one more on Zoom. You do have one more Zoom? Yep. Uh, Rick? Yeah, hello. My name is uh, Rick Mayer. I'm at 6237 Valley Field in the very top east corner of the, the, the Fleming Creek Circle. Um, I have no no observations of any flooding of any kind or in my area, but I share the same two questions that Dave had was uh, what has 20 grand a year been going to um, in terms of uh, annual maintenance on the on the creek? Um, the, all of the pictures that we saw earlier it looks like it's been uh, left to, uh, to to nature and uh, haven't seen I didn't see any signs of any sort of uh, twenty thousand dollars worth of work a year going into that place um, in any of the pictures, um, and then additionally the the concept that we would say yes or no to a project that hasn't been scoped or costed is really just beyond um, normal human comprehension. You would never shop that way. You would never consider spending your money your money in that fashion. Um, so I would hope that you would not consider spending our money in that same fashion of blind, yes, accept a project at without scope and cost to find. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. And I do have one more, um, Mike Booth. Um, hi, this is Mike Booth. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm at 3330 Woodhill Circle. Um, I think one point of confusion that if folks could address tonight that would alleviate a lot of concerns is once what decision is being made today, if we decide to proceed with the project, does that commit us to spending the money for the project or will there be a further opportunity to review the project and determine whether we proceed from there? I think a lot of folks are anxious about, you know, moving forward without any steps in the future to this, you know, if there's a, a certain amount of money that people are uncomfortable with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are, we, uh, are we good to go? All right. Uh, Clark Karen. Yep, 8963 Joy Road. Yeah, could you speak into this mic right here? Thank you. Perfect. All right, 8963 Joy Road, Plymouth, that's uh, Salem Township. So right here, we have the overhead shot. We call it Fowl Creek Farm. We raise flowers, cut flowers, we sell them. You might have seen us at the Plymouth Farmer's Market, Camp Farmer's Market. So the uh, yellow portion here is the, uh, I guess you'd say Nelson Drain, and then the other side of the road would be Fleming Creek. So the yellow is the portion that we own. And uh, we're getting pretty pretty wet lately. I've got uh, so we we purchased the property in 2013, and the first time that we had some I guess you could call it catastrophic flooding would be 2018 February. <laughs> Didn't really have any issues until last August. So I uh, had a handy dandy drone. I took some footage. That was January. Yeah, I'm not getting to that yet.
There we go. So that's uh, the main flower field. Everything's underwater. We actually had a wedding we had to cut for. It. My bucket was floating away as I was trying to fill it with flowers. Um, shortly after, the water, it, it didn't recede. It, it stayed there for a good four or five days. Everything died. Significant loss of income. So, clicking the wrong thing here. This is the front yard. Right, uh, that's Joy Road. The culverts are just out of the picture of the culverts. But, uh, this, this is what we've been getting here regularly. If we get two or three inches of rain, um, that tree right there is about to die. Here's, here's Jackie uh, pontificating where we would usually eat dinner. Um, you can see right here is the uh, Fleming Creek, and that is spilled over into the entire yard. But uh, I've got uh, some drone footage that's quite interesting. Uh, this was from January. The uh, IT department um, should uh, here we go. So this is in January. Nice little overhead shot of. So there's the house. You can see the uh, the main field covered in water. That was a substantial loss of fall planted crops, stuff that we would sell for like Mother's Day sale in the spring. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, your, your time has expired. Certainly. As intriguing as certainly. This is imagery a, is. Thank you. We appreciate you bringing that in. Absolutely. Glad you were able to see it. Excellent. All right. And I, I've had two more people raise their hand. Are you still willing to? Yes, all right. we're here for. All right, um, Augustine, you are next. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. My name is Augustine Tabling. We live over at Ford and Prospect uh, uh, 3530 uh, the, behind the fire station. Uh, and my question for, uh, uh, not sure who's the best to answer this, but basically, what would the timeline be for when we would uh, get uh, more information after, if if people decide, if you guys decide what we're, uh, that we're going ahead with this, what would the timeline be for next, or for, for more information? That's all. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Uh, and then Elizabeth. Hi, sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I'm Elizabeth Denhauter. I live at 6100 Ford Road, which quite frankly, I'm kind of looking at the map. I was sort of surprised that I'm actually considered a part of it um, because it looks like I'm like east or excuse me, west of the, of the a little bit of the purple line. Um, but I mean, I want to just kind of reinforce what the other parties have said. I mean, we have good, excellent flow on our part of the you know, with Fleming Creek. And, and I would just like to express my, you know, cause I did actually, I was another person who actually called to try to get information ahead of time and nothing was forthcoming. And it really did, I just wish the rollout had been a little bit more organized and that we had the opportunity to respond or get some information to understand the process better. So um, I just wanted to kind of reinforce, you know, a lot of the statements of the other parties and, and just to kind of express the fact of, because all of the points, the notations, that were referenced in the presentation, I know are all like, you know, northeast of me, um, but that's not, you know, like where I'm at, you know, we're not seeing that and we do see smooth flow. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Uh, we have another in-person speaker, uh, Joanne Cole.
And I just have two informational questions that didn't seem to come up tonight. First is um, when M14 was built, it changed the drainage in the area. And I was wondering if we have access to what the drainage expectations are for that area, um, including like the floodplain that's normal. Okay. Um, that was one question. The second one is what is the, I have not heard anything to differentiate between what is normal maintenance of the homeowner that abuts the drain versus what is required maintenance for the county. You know, it, and I see up and down the streets, I see a lot of variation between what homeowners think of as normal maintenance. Thank you for your comments. Last call. It looks like we have one more speaker coming up. Um, Linda Chaplow. Okay. I'm Melinda Chaplow, 7375 Plymouth Road. And um, I live between the flower farmer that spoke that has horrible flooding, and I would be very upset if I had that. And so I live between him and the Beaver Dam, and we don't have any flooding. And I'm sorry to say we haven't cleaned our brush, but I think I probably will try to do that. But um, so I'm wondering if it's not so much the beaver, or maybe there's another beaver that we don't know about, um, but maybe it's the brush cleaning that needs to be done that's causing flooding in some people's yards. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Last call. Any other any other individuals who care to speak? Any other online? I do not see any hands raised or anyone in the chat. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, are there were there any letters of comment to receive, Scott? We have not. <clears throat> so we did receive in excess of several dozen. FOIA requests for information regarding the petition, um, but we did not receive what I would call correspondence directed towards the board. Very good, thank you. Uh, at this time, we're gonna close the public comment period of this uh, hearing. And I wanna thank everybody who provided comments. Uh, this, all, this is all part of our consideration, so that's excellent. And at this point, um, we're gonna, move to a discussion by the board uh, with regard to necessity or not necessity uh, for a, a project here. So I think it would be most appropriate for us to have a motion on the floor to discuss. Typically, not to interrupt. So typically we would explain for your benefit and as well the, the public what what you're going to do and what explain the legal proceedings. Oh, please. Um, yeah, that, that would be a logical yeah. <laughs> step in here. Um, and also, if, if you want, I jotted down a few. I know there were several questions posed by the public. I don't know of any of them in particular. I could I think we could address a few of them, if not the majority of them, um, if that's your pleasure. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I know there was a question about Frames Lake permitting, well, I shouldn't say it wasn't about permitting, but a question about Crane Lake jurisdictions. So we did a, a file archive search. So we have paper files dating back to the 1800s. I did um, see a series of issued permits for related to, to Fleming Creek for some of the farm crossings that Jeff identified. Um, we get permits from the road commissions, MDOT for their crossings. Uh, I do believe um, I found a permit on file for an outlet from Frames Lake. So it's a permitted outlet into the drain, um, although the outlet itself is private and would not be subject to any work done by our office. So to address that one. Um, I think there were some questions about, well, what, what happens next if there's a project? Is there public input? Is there further 
discussion on scope of work, et cetera, because clearly we, we, we don't have that here tonight. So the, the, the answer to that is if the board votes for a necessity and, and approves a project, the Water Resources Commissioner, again, Evan Pratt, then it has full discretion to do whatever he feels necessary to solve the issues as raised by the public and, and the report. So as far as whether the public input or more dialogue, the answer to that is it depends. So if we determine with our engineering support that a project, uh, I'm gonna just say is not all that costly and like that the, the cost to a property owner might be fairly insignificant. And I know that might vary to certain people what that number is. But if we say, let's say we do a project and we say, hey, it's gonna cost the average property owner $30. Generally then we don't seek public input. We just go ahead, do the work, do the assessment. If we do uh, an engineering assessment and determine this is going to be a significant project, this is going to involve assessments ranging into thousands of dollars to some of our property owners, then I would say I'm fairly confident that in those cases, then we do convene future public hearings to gather further input on a scope of work. So again, not a satisfactory answer tonight to say, yes, we're gonna do that. No, we're not. I don't even know if we'll have a project, but generally speaking, if it gets into a large amount of money, yes, we solicit import input. If it's not over the course of the district, we don't. Is that another order determination? No, that would be purely a public meeting as um, convened by the, the commissioner. Okay. So, and then another follow-up question, which you might be able to, but um, spreading the cost out, is there any conversation or what? Yeah, if I can help with that. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I think that's a great question. I think because there was also some questions, why aren't you doing this just under uh, regular maintenance? Mm -hmm. And so, if there was a misconception about the $20,000 that we've been hearing about. So there is no budget for the water resources treasure. That is an assessment that would be levied each year. So there's not leaving money on the table. It's just a matter of um, that is the maintenance limit. And so if there is maintenance that is necessary that is above the $20,000 limit, then that requires a petition to do that. So in terms of a, a couple of different things, in terms of maintenance, should you do this and just spend $20,000 each year um, versus doing it as a petition project, getting it done at one time. So in doing it in a $20,000 each year, that may take a significant number of years to get to the point where you've hit that milestone and then you might have property owners that problems aren't solved because it's going to take a period of years that could be assessed annually. Um, then there's also the mobilization costs of, of bringing a contractor in. So there is some um, efficiencies involved in doing a maintenance project in one year versus a series of years. From a perspective of performing maintenance, if it's done in one year, again, all the costs, whether it's one year or 10 years, are still levied to the property owners. There is an opportunity to finance that over a period of years to the drainage district to, to ensure that it's affordable to the property owners. I hope, is that what you asked me? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Um, I also um, have, it looks like there was a question on a timeline following this meeting. Um, we'll talk about it briefly uh, a little later on. There is an appeal period, but uh, pending an appeal period, um, the timeline would start this fall with engagement of an engineering firm. Um, I would suspect depending again on the scope of, of the work being proposed and whether we want further public engagement, we would have a, a, a good idea of what we're gonna do by winter and be looking at 2025 for any construction related type of, type of work there. Um, I do wanna um, come to the defense of our staff. So there's a lot of questions or, or comments about delays or not getting the information that they were requested. Um, or maybe it coming from different agencies. So as a reminder, uh, the Water Resources Commissioner, elected official, um, elected by 
by the county residents, of course, but we are a department within Washington County. So we had, again, several dozen Freedom of Information Act requests on this one. And those have to be coordinated with Washtenaw County proper because we have a FOIA Freedom of Information Act coordinator. It's in a different department of ours. And I know they, our staff is working very diligently because we had to redact information to you know, uh, preserve some people's privacy. So it did take a little bit of time to work through that. I, I just want people to understand we weren't dragging our feet. It was just, we had a unusually high volume of requests and it just took us a lot of time to, to work through those. So um, I did want to address that. Um, there was a question on the effect of M14, uh, it's construction. Uh, I'm going to say, I don't have plans on it. Uh, I do know that there um, are crossings along M14 that allow flow uh, under M14 corridor and spots. Certainly the design would be the roadway would not impede flow from traveling from the north side to the south side towards the creek. I can't guarantee you, however, that's the case in all spots. Um, there was a question of homeowner rights as far as or versus county rights when it comes to clearing, doing work, etc. General rule of thumb, if you're going to put a shovel in the ground and move earth, do structures, things of that nature, permits, <laughs> permits, permits, permits. If you're not putting a shovel in the ground, so that means you're going out there, you're taking a chainsaw to deadfall, um, you're clearing brush, things of that nature where you're not putting shovels in the ground. That's your property. Those are your trees. It's private property. Certainly as a homeowner, you have rights to do that. We also have a field operations unit. One of the things we do is react to service requests. So we're saying you're not obligated to do that, but if, so if you so choose, you can call our office. Our field operations manager can get someone out there from our staff to do it as well. So again, you have the right to do it. Clearing, you put a shovel in the ground, then things change. So, um, and then finally, I think there were some questions about um, what the noted deadfalls and other obstructions, beaver dams, road crossings, the effect it's had on the drain. Um, so I will, um, I don't know if I mentioned this, so I am, uh, a licensed professional engineer in the state of Michigan. So this is my engineering opinion uh, on, on their effects. Um, I would say most of the deadfall in, in the pictures observed have uh, limited effect on the drainage there. So, so I would say, you know, 100 feet or so of effect upstream of those type of things for the most part certainly have an effect, but really dramatically. Um, the road crossings where we have dual culverts, there are a few of them. Um, in almost all cases, one of the two culverts is almost completely obscured by sediment and overgrowth that severely obstructs flow. I'd say those have a significant impact on flooding upstream um, for several hundred feet or more reaching upstream. And then the, the beaver dams in question, certainly the one on the north side of I'm 53, I would estimate, I think in our field staff has looked at, we have at least a couple thousand feet of impoundment that's been created behind that. So it, it was a channelized drain upstream of that area prior to the Breaker Dam. And now it, it literally is a um, permanent water surface for at least, I'm gonna say 2,100 feet or more. So, um, <coughs> I don't know. Did I miss any other any other question? I had I had one. Yeah. Um, I think there was a couple of comments or questions that were around the past um, details on the past assessments. Mm -hmm. So I know uh, you you gave a brief history at the beginning, yeah. but if you could give just a rough estimate, I know that we're able to spend up to twenty thousand dollars, but it looks like perhaps that varied from like. Seven cents all billion. Yes. In the last five years. That's correct. So we've averaged it, exactly. We spent between seven, I think you're right, 12,000 in the last five or six years. And uh, it's primarily, primarily been reactive maintenance uh, reactions to service requests. So admittedly, 
Um, it's it, I would consider it more uh, fixing known issues rather than routine maintenance. Um, I would say both Salem and Superior have asset management plans for stormwater with our office now. So um, we're partially um, in an overall effort to become much more proactive with the management of our drains. Uh, Fleming Creek would certainly qualify as a candidate for, for that management, but to your point, um, historically, it's we've, we've only done reactive service requests on the drain to date. That has averaged, I'm going to say, around 10,000 ish. Um, I actually have a question about sure. the, the are impoundments like beaver, you know, caused by beaver dams ever part of the design of a drain? I mean, are, are those are those naturally expected impairments of the flow, or is that really is that really outside of what was expected when the drain was established? Um, I think certainly. In, I don't know. If this is quite addressing the question directly, but I would say in our experience in the last couple of decades, um, beaver activity in Washington County, I think, has, has been increasing. Um, so we have. Uh, discovered beaver dams on a variety or a, no, a number of our county drains more, more actually more recently it's been more in like the last five to ten years and I know some yeah you know advocacy and um, conservancy groups track I think their activity a little more than I mean we don't necessarily track it but um, at the root of it I, I would say it's not an engineeringly designed feature uh, on our, our drains um, Beavers tend to be extremely efficient at repairing uh, breaches in their work. So meaning if we clear a, clear a, uh, a beaver dam away, they're very good at restoring it very, very quickly. So we, we tend to take the approach that if it's not causing a problem for, for upstream homeowners, structures, flooding, et cetera, maybe it's in a nature area. We've got a few that have been in like and be in our property or some places like that. Um, we generally won't expend the money to do anything about it. I think in other cases where they're causing clear impact, the property owners upstream, then we'll take measures to, to, to get them out. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I guess this kind of begs your question. What happens to the first? Okay, I, I, didn't want to hear, I didn't want to answer that question. So, in in the state of Michigan, currently, a beaver is considered a nuisance animal. So, our office is not allowed to relocate them. Um, we do not have that ability. It would be awesome if somebody unilaterally decided to do that. It would be great, but we cannot do it. So if we take care of a beaver dam, knowing that they're going to rebuild the dam very quickly, um, we will engage with a local trapper and permanently take care of the issue. But trapping is part of that. Yeah. So I, I don't want to, in all transparency, we, we, we will get rid of the beavers. Okay. Okay. I just want to clarify. You mentioned how fast it's rebuilt. So, you know, money spent on it. Right. A couple of questions. Um, the so five thousand limit that's currently in place. Um, when was that dollar amount first established? We're allowed to do beavers. In fact, legally, we're not allowed to in interfere with their dams. Um, so there has been a maintenance limit. Since the beginning, I think it re it went from eight hundred dollars to twenty five hundred dollars in the eighties, and then twenty five hundred dollars to five thousand um, dollars. I want to say ten or fifteen years ago, and there's legislation right now to increase that as well. Okay, so it hasn't taken into account inflation, at least in recent years. No, I think there's um, legislative amendments to add uh, an inflation indicator, but but no. No, there's not. That sounds like it makes sense. Can you well, you're also at the microphone. A lot of comments were raised about the level of transparency in this process. Mm -hmm. The fact that people had to um, file Freedom of Information Act requests to get 
what seems to be basic information. Mm -hmm. that people didn't receive a packet of information, uh, including this presentation until being at the presentation this evening. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to what flexibility a, a, a county has or what an office has in that regard? Um, because it seems like it goes beyond even this project that you know people get frustrated when they you know they're they're open to 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 proposals, right? And and mm -hmm. and to talk through um, problems and solutions, but when they feel like they're kind of cut off from the process or not being given uh, uh, you know, adequate information to be informed, people get frustrated. Can you mm -hmm. speak to that? Certainly. So um, in addition to working for this drainage district, I serve as general counsel for the Michigan Association of County Drain Commissioners and worked for several dozen drain commissioners throughout the state. And um, under the statute, notice is to be provided of the meeting. In my experience, um, information may be available in advance of the meeting. Oftentimes it is not. The purpose of this meeting is to gather information from the property owners as to the condition of the dream. And so it has been my experience that prior to um, right or wrong, what, in other counties, it is highly unusual. In fact, I, I have not seen it where a packet of information has been provided at all. Um, to the property owners prior to this meeting because it's really an information gathering for the board to make a decision about necessity. And so I know that there is frustration. So basically the board is not deciding what to do, whether there's a problem. And so the inspection report is part of that, the information from um, the property owners is part of that. And so I know there is frustration about not, and in fact, I think somebody's made my comments were maybe ridiculous with regard to why don't you have a scope and a project cost. And so we're just merely following the statute and there may be things that are brought up during this meeting by property owners um, that perhaps weren't um, available to engineers or that office prior to this meeting. And so, and, and so I don't, Right or wrong, I don't find that highly unusual. I, I think the transparency in terms of what a project is and what these reports are after after a decision is made to move forward is is generally more available throughout the state. Well, I, I certainly, questions. regardless of what we decide tonight, I, I would hope um, that that the, our local office will do everything in its power moving forward on this project or others to. Uh, and I, I know this is my first time on a board of determination, so I don't know what the history has been, but um, I do sense the frustration and I mm -hmm. certainly hope that, uh, and you mentioned, you know, if it becomes a larger scale project, particularly that starts to have a real financial impact on, on properties that you really do try to engage people in that in, in more iterative process, process going forward so that they, they do have additional opportunities for input, they're not just stuck in holding the bill for whatever uh, an engineer might decide. Thank you. It's a balance of being timely and, and following what we, what um, permits are required, the timeliness of preventing uh, a flooding event or damage to property and then providing transparency to the property owners. Mm -hmm. so, thank you. I, I would mention, and um, I got reminded, um, so like that inspection report, again, it's publicly available that we wouldn't need a FOIA mm -hmm. for that. Evidently, I mean, clearly you may not want it now um, <laughs> that it's been presented. But again, um, our staff worked very diligently on it. I will, I was reminded again, the report actually was not even completed until I'm going to say late, late last week. Maybe even it, we might have even tweaked it a little this week. So it, it wasn't like we, Jeff got the report done two days after his inspection and we've been sitting on it. It actually is, was still being compiled as late as last week. So again, in this particular case, given the volume of requests we got, um, we just didn't have the resources to get to everyone that, I, that quickly. I do want to add that when the report did become available, anybody that did request it in a FOIA request and it got denied, we did reach out to you via email and give you that report as soon as it was available. Yesterday. It, it was pretty close to the meeting. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> All right. Questions? No? We may have some more questions as we deliberate. Okay. Certainly. Fair enough. So um, so I'm gonna go ahead. Um,
I'm going to explain kind of the legal proceedings that are, that are going to occur now, um, resulting from either it's going to either be an affirmative or a negative vote on the question of necessity. And again, this is according to the Drain Code Law, Public Act 40 in 1956 is a method, um, what you're going to do here. So uh, if you're if the board, if it's done by a majority vote, uh, determines a project is necessary, the Water Resources Commissioner is then required to proceed with the project to construct and or improve the drainage district. If the board determines that a project is not necessary, this process just comes to an end. And a new petition to do further improvements cannot be filed with our office for a period of one year after tonight. So, um, that being said, there is an appeal process. Um, under the drain code, there's a, there's a section that states, if any person feels aggrieved by the decision that's made tonight, you know, whether you agree with an affirmative or a negative vote, um, you do have 10 days from tonight to file an action in Washington Circuit Court. So that there is a legal option if you do not agree with the decision and, and wish to, to appeal it. Also the townships, um, that's a little different for them. I think they have the opportunity to appeal to probate court, not circuit court. You should say that. Okay. Well, I got changed. Okay. I got an outdated version. <laughs> so, is it the same for townships now? Yep. Okay. So I guess townships similar, they can also uh, appeal. So Salem Superior, if, if they so chose. So that, that would um, be the result of immediately upon your decision tonight, what the legal proceedings are going to be. Um, so with that being said, I can let you get back to your agenda. Okay. Um, so at this point, I think we do need a motion for us to consider. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, we're not going to is now. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, we have a motion. Well, it would be well. Pick one. Either, either we're we're considering the it is necessary or it is not necessary. Right, right. So you have a you have either one that you care to. <laughs> Right. Um, I will. I will move to that to uh, uh, make it necessary. Okay. Put it, on, put it on the floor. Okay. Is there support for that? I support that. Okay. It's been moved and seconded um, that we would uh, create an order determining uh, that the proposed drain project that's set forth in the petition is necessary, and conducive to public health, convenience, or and or welfare. Um, so, comments, thoughts. Is before we uh, before we get down to voting? Um, no, I really appreciated the follow up. You answered a lot of the questions that I got that I had through this process. Is it okay? No, I thought the the, the uh, uh, presentation was was really helpful, and the photographs to, that kind of uh, documented what. Uh, was observed, so I really appreciate the staff uh, getting out and getting dirty to uh, gather that information on our behalf. I feel it's very helpful. And clearly, there are issues. Um, you know, it's. I, I think there was some feedback from the public uh, and even from staff that it's not entirely clear always what what the the most appropriate solutions are uh, and how expensive those solutions might be. And I realize that becomes then the next step in the engineering process. Um, but clearly, you know, especially with a few property owners, particularly that have dealt with some very serious flooding, uh, that may or may not end up being directly related to improvements that would be made to this train, but certainly seems worthy of at least taking the time to um, evaluate uh, the, the scope of the problem and, and what potential solutions might be. So that, that, that's my inclination and the support this resolution is presented. Uh, yeah, I, I, so I've had the opportunity, privilege, honor to sit on a few different boards of determination. Um, there's always folks who come in and, and, and will tell us that they've had no problem whatsoever and that no additional work needs to be done. 
And then we have folks who come in with what I would consider nearly catastrophic images demonstrating how big the problem is. Um, so while your while your local impact will vary greatly, um, you know, we're really looking at the, the health and the operation of the overall drain uh, at this point. So my my inclination would be to similarly would be to support that. Um, any other considerations or thoughts that we should take into account? Um, I'm taking it to the conversation around the limit, the annual limit, which is the 20,000, and Frank a good point um, that maybe that limit is not adequate um, because it sounds like it's been primarily reactionary about a number of dollars that have been spent on the drain, and still there are problems. And so to me, I think it, you know, the report Jeff that you provided regarding the sedimentation and then the two beaver dams that have clearly are creating this impoundment and substantial flooding that is impairing the purpose of the drain appear to be evident during that report, especially report. Yeah, and I, I guess the other thing I, I would like to, to comment is given the, the history of past assessments, um, they haven't, the commissioner's office has not come close to spending the, the $20,000 limit since at least 2014. So uh, it's not that uh, perhaps more money could have been spent, but that's all assessed uh, per Stacy's comment. And just, just so folks know, in 2015, there were, it was uh, $12,729.63 uh, was assessed. And that was a cost per parcel of six dollars and three cents for a year yeah. on average. So that that kind of puts it in perspective for me anyway. So yeah. And you, yeah, just, just a point of uh, curiosity, I guess. Assuming that uh, 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 we do move ahead with this project, there's an engineering assessment. There's even some work potentially done uh, based on the problems that are are examined. It, 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 does the project typically include funding for um, longer term uh, oversight and maintenance of what improvements are actually put in place? If I, if I understand the question, I, I would say that that would fall under the, asset, the stormwater asset management plan for the, the individual townships. So in that sense, yes, there would be a, an overall plan for a, a I call it an indefinite period of time going forward for the maintenance and operations of the drain. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, we don't, um, at Mr. Pratt or uh, Evans, I think makes a much better analogy of car maintenance versus car repairs. That certainly you don't want to wait for the car to break down and, and, and repair it then if we can do regular maintenance and reduce the life cycle costs. So yes, we definitely have a compelling interest to do to do a maintenance program so that we're not wasting right. what monies we would potentially spend now. Yes, that's critical to hear. Any further discussion? All right, this uh, time. Do, you, do we need a roll call on this? Just a standard regular. Yeah, sure. okay. So the motion on the on the on the floor is to uh, find that this project would be necessary, conducive for uh, public health, convenience, and or welfare. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. The motion carries. All right. So it's not to interrupt. No, it is to interrupt. But that's <laughs> not You're correct. I am interrupting. Um, so before you proceed, so what we do under the drain code, now the secretary has some business to conduct. So under your order tab, it's at the back of your book, there's um, two orders. And the first one is an order of necessity. The second is an order of no necessity. You would, you would read the first one out loud to, for the public's knowledge. So as charged as the secretary. I will read the order of necessity for the Plumbing Creek drain. Right now, 
whereas a meeting was held by the Board of Determination on July 23rd, 2024 at Superior Township Hall, 3040 North Prospect Road, Superior Township, Michigan, 48198, and whereas the said Board of Determination received evidence and heard testimony regarding the petition dated March 18th, 2024, for maintenance and improvement of the drain, and after receiving evidence and hearing testimony, made its determination whether the proposed drain project is necessary and conducive to public health, convenience, or welfare, pursuant to Chapter 8 of Public Act 40 of 1956 as amended. Now, therefore, be it ordered and determined that the proposed drain project, as set forth in the petition, is necessary and conducive to public health, convenience, or welfare. Thank you. And at this point, you're going to talk a little bit more about the appeal process. Yeah, I, just to read it, it kind of jumped ahead. But again, um, any property owner that is feels aggrieved by the decision to uh, for an approval of the project, you now have 10 days to to file action in Washtenaw County Circuit Court, and similarly. Uh, the townships or municipalities also have that right if they so chose. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to thank my fellow board members and staff and our court reporter and Stacy uh, and, of course, Evan, our commissioner, um, for setting this up. This has been an absolutely wonderful presentation and work back this evening. Um, I thank you for making our consideration a little easier that way. So thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Move and support. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. I'd like to thank everybody who came out this evening uh, for participating in local government. <laughs>